Yeah, Philippians chapter 3 in our Bibles this morning. By way of uh, introduction, we're going to have a look at the Apostle Paul's testimony uh, before he was saved and uh, his motivation uh, for his whole Christian life. And we'll begin reading from verse 7. He says, What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And so, we're going to see, I want to encourage us with this central thought here, this phrase, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, Lord, we thank you for your Son, Thank you that it's in his name that we gather, in your name, Father, and meet together to hear your word. You're the very reason why we, we gather and do what we do as Christians. And I pray that you would uh, use your word, and bless your word to our hearts this morning. Thank you for your son, our saviour. It's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. So from verse 4 to 6 for context, Paul gives us his life. Uh, before he was saved, before he knew the Lord. And he says in verse 4, he says, Though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any man uh, think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But, those, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So the summary of this is that if anyone could be right with God by keeping the law or by his background or heritage, it was Paul. If anyone could boast in, uh, in the flesh and in, in these, uh, be proud of themselves in order to please God by their own works, it was Paul. Uh, we see that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he was a Pharisee. He persecuted the church by his zeal in his ignorance. And so Paul, no doubt, was a, was a man that was zealous, he was religious. And, but notice verse 7, he says, What things were gained to me, they were gained to him. He says, Those I counted loss for Christ. So this man realised he had to let go of his own works, his own righteousness, his own religion in order to be right with God and have peace with God, have uh, God pleased with him. And it wasn't by trusting in his own works and he realised that with his own uh, religion and his righteousness. He, he trusted in all these things before and he didn't know who the Lord was, who Jesus was. And so he realised that he had to make the decision to renounce it all, to abandon it all, and count it all as filthy rags. And uh, all his self-effort, uh, his energies in the flesh to please God. And uh, then Paul was saved by the grace of God, and, and it never stops there. He says in, in verse 8, in the present tense, he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. So he first counted his own righteousness to be filthy rags, the time of his conversion, but here in the present tense, somewhat 20 years after he's saved, he still counts all but loss for Christ. And he says, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And uh, we've got to remember that Paul wrote this from prison. He wrote this, uh, having lost the freedoms of normal life. Uh, he was in a dark and dirty cell when he wrote this. But he counted all these things that were gained to him, loss for Christ, and even still after being saved, he never regretted uh, getting saved and coming to the Lord. And so, what an attitude Paul had. He counted it all but dung, he says. He says, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ or gain Christ. As a saved man, he counted all these things but rubbish. Uh, and Paul... He, he counted the loss worthless. He, he wasn't regretting the fact that he'd, he'd gained Christ or what he found in Christ. He gave it all up to gain Christ. 
And verse 9, he says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so Paul realised that his standard of righteousness with his religion, it comes short of God's perfect standard of righteousness. And so he gained Christ and the result of that, he had a new standing with God. He had a reconciliation with God. He had forgiveness with God. And that's the only way that someone can be justified in the sight of God. It's by faith in Jesus Christ, like he says in verse 9. And uh, in verse 10, we see Paul's motivation, why he did what he did as a Christian for his Christian life and calling. We see in verse 10, the person, the power and the passion of Christ was his motivation. And so verse 10, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And so what, what does God reveal about his son, our Lord Jesus Christ? What did Paul see and how could he say the excellency of the knowledge of Christ? He lost, counted all but lost for this. What, what did God reveal to him? And so first we'll see his, his motivation was the person of Christ. Jesus is the very central truth of the, of the entire Bible from Genesis through to Revelation. God's plan and purpose is centred in Christ before the foundation of the world that Christ would be the one in which people can know God. It was the very word of God that's made, it's made known to us and it's in, unfolded again through Genesis through to Revelation, it's all centered in Christ. God had revealed that the person of Christ pre-existed from eternity past to the Apostle Paul. He wrote to the Colossians and in verse 17, he says, He is before all things and by him all things consist. So as a religious man, I, I, I doubt that Paul knew the person of Christ. Uh, he, he, he just wanted to get rid of the, the Christians. He persecuted them those that followed the Lord. But now he counted it all loss for this excellency of knowledge that Christ is the creator of the universe. He's before all things. He's the sustainer of the universe. The Hebrew writer says he upholds all things by the word of his power. And John's gospel begins with Christ as God. We see in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So it's because of the Lord that we have life. And Paul saw that, and he realised that. And Jesus has always been from eternity past. He always existed. And, uh, and he knew him not only as creator, not only as God, but as the Lord. He says, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so the Lord meaning he's the absolute possessing supreme power and authority, he's master of heaven and earth. Later on, he calls him the Lord of glory, he calls him the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord of lords. And so absolute deity and other divine names are given to Christ. They are ascribed to Jesus and he, he, you know, he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the shepherd of our soul. He's the saviour. He's uh, God in the flesh. And so, moving on to this next point here, his, his pre-existence, we see, but the manifestation of God, his manifestation on the earth. But John says in his gospel that the word was made flesh. And uh, the scriptures and the prophecies were fulfilled concerning uh, the son that would come. And Matthew 1, 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And Paul said God was manifest in the flesh, and so he realised and understood uh, his reason for life, the one that gave him life, was God, was Christ. And uh, Jesus is one with the Father, as he said to Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He is the second person of the Godhead, the only begotten Son, manifest on this earth. He walked the earth. And these wonderful truths are the centre and foundational truth of the Christian faith and Christian life, knowing the Lord Jesus. 
the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Peter confessed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the Word of God. He's the expressed image of God. He's the manifestation of God. He's uh, the divine person of God in the flesh. Paul said to the Colossians, he says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And one preacher put it like this, God in a body. The fullness of God in a body. So he wasn't merely God-like, but he was God and he is God. And Paul realized this, and he goes on to say in verse 10, Ye are complete in him, believers are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. And so the person of Christ, it, 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 he, he, he counted all but loss for, for the person of his salvation. And he goes on to, uh, to say that he's, he's, he's God, like what we just saw. Jesus is the one who all the prophets preached and pointed toward in the Old Testament that fulfilled and came to fulfill the prophecies. In, in the Gospels, we see this in the earthly life and ministry of Christ. And Jesus himself testified to the fact that he pre-existed before Abraham. He said that to the Pharisees. He says, before Abraham was, I am the self-existent one. And this is our saviour. And all these wonderful truths, they just they revive the soul. They encourage. And I thank the Lord for this. And we see Christ as creator as well, who calmed the storm, who walked upon the Sea of Galilee, who bring the fishes into the nets of the disciples, the multitude of fish. We see him as God who forgave sin, who healed the brokenhearted. We see him addressed and worshipped as Lord by the centurion, by the uh, Canaanite woman, by Mary, Martha, his disciples and others, many others, addressed him as Lord. And the psalmist said in Psalm 86, 15, Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. And we see that in the Gospels, the heart of Christ, moved with compassion for the lost multitudes, the, the heart of Christ, meek and lowly. The, the, we see the, the love of Christ. We see the compassion, the patience. The, we see the grace of God in the, in the birth of Christ. We see the long-suffering, the patience of our Lord. We see his, his mercy and his, his truth. When the Word was manifest in the flesh, John said that he's full of grace and truth. And so we see that in the life of our Saviour. And no wonder why the world, by the way, mocks and blasphemes Christ. And just recently, the 2024 Olympic Open in Paris, they mocked at the Last Supper with all transvestites and homosexuals and transgender people, or just mocking the Lord. Why? Because he's the way, the truth and the life. He's the only way you can know God. He is God. And that's why people hate him and mock him. And uh, so the application for us as Christians is not to forget this, the person of Christ and how he's the centre of our whole Christian life. Why we do what we do. We come to church, we gather for prayer meeting, we pray, we read our Bible, we do all that because of Christ and how he had mercy upon us, how he saved us. And Paul, he, he not only wanted to know the divine person of Christ more intimately, this is why he actually says this, as, as a Christian he says that I may know him. He wanted a deep, vital, intimate relationship with Christ and uh, the shepherd of his soul, the one that saved him. And so, as we've received Christ Jesus the Lord, we ought to walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. This is how uh, we live our Christian life. It's in Christ. And uh, He not only wanted to know the divine person of Christ, but secondly, the power of Christ. He says in verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And so the power of Christ is, is known to us when we were saved. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creations in Christ. All things have passed away and all things have become new. And Ephesians 2 says, You hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so he said to the Corinthians as well that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
It's the power of Christ that raises a dead man in sin to life everlasting. That's how we have life and we're alive unto God. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so Paul got saved and he wrote that even to the Romans that Jesus is compared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So it's by his power and the power of his resurrection that we're saved and made alive unto God. But secondly, his power is still at work in us. It never stopped at salvation where his power works in our sanctification. And this is the cry of Paul's heart here. He earnestly wanted to live out the rest of his Christian life appropriating the power of Christ in a practical sense. Right after speaking of the gospel, he says to the Ephesians, he says, whereof I was, a, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So he, he was a minister of the Lord by God's grace, gifting him by the working of his power, working effectually in him. And the great commission for the church is given by him that has all power in heaven and in earth. He says, go. And Jesus, before he ascended, he said in Acts 1, and ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So we're byproducts of that, and we're sealed and dwelt with the Spirit of God when we're saved, when we believe the gospel. And so God gives us power, divine enablement to carry out the very things that he's called us to do as Christians. He gives us spiritual gifts, talents and abilities in order to fulfill the calling of God upon our life and to be his witnesses. And uh, it was this power that was working in Paul that he would uh, feed the church of God, that he would go out and reach the lost and warn every man with tears and knowing the terror of the Lord, he would persuade men because it was God working in him and through him. You, you remember what he said to the Philippians in chapter 2? He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. So God working in us, not only for salvation, but sanctification. And uh, as Christians, we, we knew his power when we got saved. We, we were given the spirit of God, but we had to continue to realize his power. And notice what Paul says in his prayer to the people of God in Ephesians. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. But notice verse 20, he says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So we see the power of Christ working in us and through us, and we ought to live our Christian life in the Spirit of God by faith. And that's how, that's how we're to do it, is walk in the Spirit as we live in the Spirit. I believe Paul knew that for himself. And, uh, and he couldn't finish the course and keep the faith if it weren't for, for God working in him, God's spirit in him. And he wrote to the Romans, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And Paul prayed for the Colossian believers that they might walk worthy of the Lord under all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And notice verse 11, he says, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness and this is how we can endure how we can run the race how we can finish well by his strength his glorious power working in us and uh, and the fruit of that is patience long suffering and joyfulness and that's the theme by the way of philippians rejoicing in christ what we have in the lord and uh, we see the power of Christ at work uh, in, in, in sanctification, in salvation, but also in our glorification. 
in that coming day when we're going to be raised. Paul said at the end of this chapter, he said, Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So as he was raised, we will be raised. As he was resurrected, we will be resurrected. And uh, he came, this is the whole purpose why Jesus came, to abolish death and bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's what Paul said to the believers, to Timothy. And he says, uh, in Christ we have a lively hope. Peter says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our faith is not in vain. The Saviour lives. That's why Paul says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For your, your labour is not in vain in the Lord. He lives and is the rewarder of, of all men, going to give to men according to their works. And, uh, and that's no doubt for the Christian, that's the judgment seat of Christ. We're not judged for our sin, but we're judged for our service and the way we live is unto the Lord. So it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, this resurrection, the power of his resurrection working in us. We can live with a sure expectation, a confidence that our eternal destiny will be with the Lord forever. The, the resurrection, that, that, that's, that's a truth that the believer ought to reside in and just com completely just keep you going. But Christ rose. We're, this world is not our home. We're just the passing through. Jesus is coming again with power and great glory. He's seated on the right hand of power as we speak. And so as Christians, the, the warning for us is not to revert back to the works of the law or trying to be perfected or please God by the work of the flesh. And that's why Paul tells us, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, and uh, be filled with the Spirit as, as a Christian. The Galatians were bewitched and they obeyed not the truth. And Paul reminds them that they received the Spirit by faith in the Gospel and not by the works of the law. And he says in chapter 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you made perfect by the flesh? The answer is no, we're not made perfect in the flesh. And so Paul knew that uh, it's by the spirit of God, by the power of God in us, uh, through the resurrection that we can live the Christian life pleasing God. And that's by faith, faith alone. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And so his motivation was not only we see the divine person of Christ, and the glorious power of Christ that saved and sanctifies and that one day will glorify us in that day. But thirdly, the passion of Christ. He says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So Paul knew the person, he knew the power, and as a result was a partaker of his persecution, his suffering. He, again, he wrote this from prison. He said to the Galatians, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. So it was a, it's a personal experience, a powerful experience, but it's a painful one. And again, we have to understand that Paul was called to be an apostle by the will of God. He, uh, he was told right from the beginning of his ministry or his calling as a Christian, he would suffer many things. And, uh, and so... You know, Christ suffered for us, but we're, we are also called to suffer for him. But Paul suffered in a manner that, you know, we, we, more, than, more than any of us. But, uh, but he could still say that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings, the companionship, the, he wanted to associate, he wasn't ashamed of the sufferings of Christ, bearing it in his own body. And so now let us consider to be reminded of the sufferings of Christ that Paul was unashamed to identify with. Uh, just thinking about how we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, thought I would uh, really dig into this and his sufferings for us and what it means and why Paul wanted to fellowship in them. You know, Isaiah the, uh, prophesied of Jesus that his visage 
was marred more than any man. We see pictures and paintings of Christ all around the world, but not one of them do justice to who he is in Scripture and what the sufferings he endured as it's revealed in Scripture. To quote a Bible teacher on this verse, he said, This speaks of the cruel and vicious beating Jesus endured at the hand of his enemies. Jesus was beaten more severely than any man would ever be beaten, so badly that he hardly looked like a man. Jesus was marred more than any man. Never was a man barbarously treated as was the Son of God. The Bible says in John 19 verse 1, Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And one preacher explains scourging, that the Romans used what's called a cat of nine tails, a whip for the punishment of criminals. They would attach at the end of these leather straps sharp objects like metal, glass, stone, pieces of bone. And the soldiers would then take this whip, this flogging tool of torture, and they would put stripes upon the back of the criminal guilty of a crime. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul states his sufferings and amongst all these things, he said five times of the Jews, I received 40 stripes, save or accept one. So for preaching the gospel, Paul uh, was scorched by the Jews. He had his back ripped open for the gospel's sake. And the Jews under Jewish law, they had a limit to how many stripes one could place upon the back of a criminal. And the Jews considered the 40th stripe to bring death. So 39 stripes was their maximum penalty. But Jesus wasn't scourged by the Jews. He was handed over to the Romans for scourging. And they had no limit. They had no maximum penalty. The history records that the Romans would scourge a man about 150 times. And each stripe, the sharp objects would bite into the flesh and the soldiers with their strength would tear back the flesh off the, the, off the body. And it's said by one preacher that it exposed the very organs of Christ because his visage was marred more than any man. Our Lord said through the prophet Isaiah, I gave my back to the smiters. Think of Jesus' body in that state before he ever went to the cross. His back was ripped open, torn to shreds. Matthew's account tells us, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. So wearing that crown of thorns, the soldiers would have driven it further into his skull with that reed hitting him on the head. Luke tells us that when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? You know, this man's meant to be God, and they're hitting him blindfolded. Who is it? And mocked him. And he said, Through the prophet, I gave my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I turned not my face away from shame and spitting. Matthew says that when they did spit in his face, they buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. The hands that touched the eyes of the blind and gave sight, the hands that washed his disciples' feet, the hands that broke the bread that night when he was crucified, those beautiful hands of Christ were pierced and nailed to the cross. And this divine person that has all power that we've looked at, he submitted himself to this suffering. Why? for us. Christ died for us. Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The stripes that he bore and the thorns that he wore told his mercy and love evermore. And my heart bowed in shame as I called on his name, and Calvary covers it all. That day he saved my soul, I'll never forget it. He died to be our substitute. Peter says that Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 
His soul was made an offering for sin, our sin, on that cross once and for all. One commentator on this, he says, it is that by which God covers, overlooks and pardons the penitent and believing sinner because of Christ's death. Christ is the sacrifice. His death is set forth as the ground on which a righteous God can pardon the guilty and sinful without any way compromising his perfect righteousness. My guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it all. Paul said he, the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When we think that God is son not sparing, sent him to die, scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away our sin. That's why Paul counted all that was gained to him loss. It's for Christ. He died taking the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He lives to give all that believe God's perfect righteousness as the substitute. Our own righteousness will never be acceptable to God. It will never please God. It's filthy rags. And uh, if, if you're here in this room and you haven't come to Christ and believed on the Lord, come. Believe on Him. The requirement for anyone to be saved is to repent and believe the Gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote that Jesus gave Himself a ransom for all. He paid the price to deliver us, to free us from bondage, slavery to sin. He paid the price. Jesus paid it all. And all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it, washed it white as snow. The redemptive work of Christ that we're talking about is the very central purpose of his coming, his incarnation, his birth. He came to save people from their sin. And there could be no redemption, there could be no resurrection were it not for the cross, were it not for the crucifixion of Christ. And the death of Jesus is the grand theme in heaven. We read that in Revelation 5. You have the, the thousands and thousands of angels and elders and beasts, and they're saying, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and honor and glory. Thou art worthy, O Lord. They're, they're, and they're, they're praising the lamb that was slain, and he, he, the sinless, spotless lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. It was always God's plan and purpose to save sinners through his son by faith the whole entire bible from cover to cover it reveals the excellency of the knowledge of christ this is why paul could say i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ that liveth in me in the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me God in His love. God commended His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how He could say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Even in, a, in a, being imprisoned and scourged and starving, persecuted and despised and rejected of men, even as His Saviour was, He could still say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the, the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's the only way to please God. And his bonds in Christ were for the advancement of the gospel. We see that in chapter 1 in Philippians he, the, the, for being in bonds for the gospel message, it encouraged other brethren to wax confident, be bold to speak the word without fear. And that's what it ought to do in our hearts and lives, and be unashamed of Christ, because he wasn't ashamed of us when he hung there naked in shame for our sin on the cross. His motivation was the person, the power, and the passion of Christ. And he wanted to know the fellowship in his sufferings. 
even more so than what he already faced. Verse 10, he says, being made conformable unto his death. So he not only had a personal, powerful, painful experience, but a, a purposeful one. It was to conform him into the image of Christ, into his Saviour. Being a partaker of Christ's suffering and associating ourselves with it in any form, it brings us nearer to the heart of God and the will of God. It, ca it causes us to become Christ-like people. The entire purpose of our salvation is, is that we'd be conformed into the image of his dear Son, our Saviour. Paul said to Timothy, he said, Be not ashamed of the gospel. He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And he writes to the Corinthians and says, We always, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. One commentator said on that verse, Paul invites every Christian to a special glorious intimacy with God. This is a relationship and transforming power that is not the property of just a few privileged Christians, it can belong to all. And the saddest thing is that Christians today are not willing to, to suffer for their Saviour when it comes down to the crunch. And this is why I believe he puts the power of his resurrection before the sufferings, because it takes God's grace and God's spirit in us, the spirit of glory in that hour when you suffer for Christ and for the gospel. Philippians 3.14 He's, we need to share this attitude that the Apostle Paul had. He knew he hadn't arrived yet. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He pressed. He, he knew he hadn't got there yet. He knew that character needed to be built up in him. Christ's likeness. He strived and strained toward the goal. What God saved him to become in Christ and, uh, you know, why, why could he say, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I kept the faith? I believe he could say that because he knew, he knew the one that saved him. He knew the centre of the faith, the author, the finisher of his faith was Christ. He knew it was Christ that put him on that course and uh, called him into the ministry. He knew that it was the Lord, the centre, the root, like we heard last week, you know, our... our, our roots in the gospel. The Christian's roots ought to be in the gospel. And we need that passion that Paul had. We need that, that pressing onward and upward, that attitude for a deeper, more intimate relationship with Christ, our walk with God, in character, in grace, growing in the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, all that he is and all that he does for us, all that he did for us, to save our soul from the pits of hell, sin, death and hell. We, we, we need that, we need to keep him preeminent first in our life, in all that we do. He's worthy. And so if you're not saved, come to Christ, believe on the Lord, taste and see that he's good. Yeah, allow him to forgive you and wash you of your sin. Trust in him as your saviour. Call upon him while he's near. And not only for the unsaved, but for the saved. Come to know his person, his power, and his resurrection via the cross. It's the cross. And for the Christian, it ought to strengthen us in our faith. It ought to keep us in the love of God. It ought to cause us to be rooted and built up in him. It should bring us back to our first love for the Lord when we saw him high and lifted up when he died for us. To cherish and adore him, to love him. It ought to cultivate this earnest desire that Paul had, knowing that he hadn't arrived. This desire for spiritual growth, Christ-likeness, surrender 
and service. It ought to stir our soul. It ought to cause us to burn with holy zeal for the love that God has bestowed upon us. We love Him because He first loved us. It should cause us to glory in the Lord with joy unspeakable, full of glory that is risen. He lives. One day we'll see His face. And you remember when after He rose and He appeared to the disciples, they didn't know it was Him. But he, he, he said, see, look at my hands. And he said, look at my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And then, then you see Thomas. He said, except I see, I won't believe. Eight days later, Jesus appears in the room in his glorified body. And then he shows him his wounds. He shows him his side. And then Thomas breaks before God and he says, my Lord... And my God, may we know and be drawn to the person, the power, and the passion of our Saviour. Be refreshed and revived in our Christian lives. Christians, followers of Christ, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He that bears not his cross and comes after him is not worthy of him. I want to be worthy of the Lord. I want to please the Lord. I want to finish what he's called me to do. And that, that should be the desire of every single one of us in our calling as Christians, as a father, as a husband, as, as a preacher, as a teacher, and all the rest, as a worker. That we may finish our course well, finish well, keep the faith. That we'd not be ashamed before him at his coming. Because as he is, so are we in this world. That's what John said that we'd hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. We're called the faithful in Christ, and because of the gospel, we have all these spiritual blessings in Christ. He is the center, the root of all these wonderful realities that we have, eternal blessings. Without Christ, there's no eternal blessing for anyone. Without faith in Christ and a relationship with God through His Son, there's no blessings that last for all eternity. We can have no redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins without faith in Christ and what He did for us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. May God work His, His power, His passion, his, his, the, the glorious person of our salvation, that we'd not lose sight of him, we'd not push him out and uh, keep him out of the church, amen? Let's pray.